Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to WOTC this morning. Um, as you noticed, we, we had two types of songs today. One is confession, faith in Jesus Christ. One is confession of sin. We're talking about this, this topic of confession, but confession has a few components. And a few of those components have their own little component of itself. And so we're going to look at that today because confession is a foundation of the Christian faith. Many of you may not know that. Many of you think, well, it's just something that one particular denomination makes us do. But confession from the beginning is a foundation of the Christian faith. It's a foundation that was even started even as God began to call Israel out of Egypt and begin to give them the law and give them their their really the structure of how they were to approach him and so this has been something that's been a foundation a cornerstone if you will of the faith and so it's not just words we say it's not just something that uh someone makes us do to make us feel bad that's what many people think they think well they just want us to confess it to make us feel bad but no and i'm going to show you even in modern day psychology, not that we lean on psychology, but they've they've shown the value of confession, of letting things out and not holding them in, not carrying them on your own. Now, the one thing that we want to talk about is in today's society, you hear it all of the time. You hear this phrase, well, it's not your fault. Well, if you did this, it's not your fault. And we see people blaming and this is this is a, a a portion of the fall of adam we we saw adam when adam fell when adam sinned instead of adam owning his sin one of the first things he did besides hide is blame the first thing he did was he blamed god and then he blamed the woman that god gave him for his sin and see what confession does is it shuts that down if you're confessing, there's no place for blame. If you're confessing, you're owning your situation. You're owning your choices. You're owning your state. And so it destroys the blame and can release the fear. So you can come to the Lord freely and receive what you need. And so as we move into this topic of confession, you're going to see value right away. Because it frees us, it, it, it opens us up, it allows us to be transparent before our Father in heaven and receive the help that we need mentally, emotionally, and even physically. And so let's go ahead and move into, I'm going to share the, my screen with you all, and we're going to move into this topic of confession. I promise you it's extremely powerful, and you're going to see a benefit right away. Before we leave today, those of you who have kind of moved away from that that thought of confession, have moved away from letting certain things out that you've carried. By the end of this topic today, by the grace of God, I believe you're going to be able to set that free. You're going to be able to say some things you've not been able to say. You're going to be able to confess some things you haven't been able to confess because you, you've been afraid. But I promise you, you will experience freedom in a whole new level when you engage in this act of confession. So let's talk about this. Let me share my screen with you guys again. All right. So here we go, confession. And yes, one of these pictures are really graphic because one part of that confession has nothing to do with confessing sin. And we're going to talk about that. That's a reality. That's a modern day confession today. So let's talk about confession. Right in the beginning, when God was bringing his people together, when he was forming the nation of Israel, he told Moses, he said, speak to the children of Israel. And when a man or a woman commits any sin that men commit in unfaithfulness against the Lord, that person is guilty. Then he shall confess the sin which he's committed. See, what this does is it flies in the face of blame. It flies in the face of hiding. Okay. 
Why? Because generally when we sin, we feel shame. And when we feel shame, we want to hide. That's what, that's what Adam did in the garden. He knew that he'd sinned. And when he heard God calling him, he hid. And when God was calling him, saying, Adam, where are you? He says, Lord, I heard your voice and I was afraid. God knew immediately what he'd done. He knew immediately that he disobeyed. And as we go on to this dialogue, we find that he said, why were you afraid? He says, because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit I told you not to eat? And then Adam begins to release the blame. You know, the, the woman you gave me, right? So the blame starts. What confession does is it shuts that down. I can't blame my father for my bad choices as an adult. I can't blame someone else. For making me do something. I chose to do that. Yeah, they may have created the atmosphere where I want to, but they can't make me do it. And of course, for those of you that are old enough to remember old Flip Wilson, right? The devil made me do it. Well, the devil can't make you do it. He has no authority and no power to make you do it. He may tempt you with something you already like, but he didn't make you do it. And so what happens? Well, we, when we choose to say, you know what, I, I own this, I did this, or I failed to do this, it frees us. It opens up a doorway for God to, to show us mercy. And we're going to look at that when we move farther down into the confession here. But we have this thing of personal confession where we have sinned, right? There's that place where we personally have sinned. And we've looked at this for those of us that have been with us at, in um, – BTA, we've looked at Joshua 719. And Joshua told Achan what Achan do. Achan, after as they were attacking Jericho, they were told to destroy everything, leave nothing, and don't do not touch the accursed things, the things that were going to be dedicated to God. They weren't to touch anything, but to burn it all with fire as a memorial to God. What do you do? Achan had saw some things. They caught his eye. He, he knew they were valuable and he wanted them, and so he took them. The consequences of that were when they were to go to the next city and they were to to engage the next city in battle, Israel lost and they and they lost some people because Achan had done this. Well he hid it. Well God told Joshua this is this is why this happened. Someone has sinned and, and of course God leads them through this process in leading them to the person that sinned. And so once he realized it was this Achan he tells him, he says, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel. Make confession to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And that's what God says to us. Because, see, when we trust him enough to share the truth, when we come to the Lord and we confess the truth, then the Lord can free us. He can heal us. But if we hide it, if we make excuses, when we cover our sin, what that does is it creates a wall or a barrier, really a personal prison. And the one who has the key is you. And so you've locked yourself in and you won't let yourself out. And so even God, he has to wait on you to unlock the door so you can get out. How do we do that? Confession. Leviticus 5 5 when of course you know in Leviticus is where they were getting Levitical law you're going to hear something similar to what he said here in Numbers 5 that shall be when he is guilty of any of these matters that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing and Ezra 10 10 when the people had gone into captivity in Babylon they were there 70 years and then God began to release them back home some of the priests had not kept themselves pure during that, you know, in the lineage of the priesthood. They hadn't kept themselves pure. They hadn't kept themselves separate, which they knew they were to be separate. But what they had done is they had mixed with the people. As a matter of fact, had, had mixed the bloodlines. And so there were impurities in the bloodline of the priesthood. And so Ezra, being this, this priest of himself, and, and he begins to declare, look, you guys need to fix this. You need to do What's right? And so then Ezra stood up here, Ezra 10, 10 through 11. He says, and Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have transgressed and have taken pagan wives. Adding to the guilt of Israel because they had already been kicked out of their homeland for paganism. It says, now, therefore, make confession to the Lord, your God, God, your, your God of your fathers. 
and do his will. Separate yourself from the peoples and the land and from the pagan wives. Separate yourself from the sin. Confess and separate. And see, that's a picture of what happened when John the Baptist called the people and prepared them for Jesus, right? We have already talked about repentance. Well, confession goes along with repentance. We confess our sin and we repent. We turn. As a matter of fact, that second song was called that the uh, confession. And, and it's talking about confession of sin, of personal sin, and repentance. They go hand in hand because it's hard to truly repent when you won't confess the truth. It's hard to fully give yourself to repentance when you won't speak the truth. And so Ezra pushed them to say, no, you need to separate yourself and be pure again. And of course, as we're called to be a nation of kings and priests in Christ Jesus, we're called to separate ourselves and confess our sin, forsake that sin, repent, and move in the other direction and allow God to have his way inside us. Psalm 32, 5, this is a Psalm of David. And David, of course, he had sinned with Bathsheba. He had committed adultery and then had her husband pushed to the front lines of the battle and murdered uh, by the, the, the uh, people they were fighting. He had the rest of his army pull back where Uriah was kind of fighting by himself. And, of course, he was cut down. He was, he was murdered, essentially, by David. And so David was convicted by the prophet Nathan. And so in one of his psalms, David goes to the Lord. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you. And my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And that's the beauty of this. And we're going to see this when we look at the New Testament scripture. When we confess, we're told that the Lord is faithful to forgive and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He, he forgives us and then he cleanses our conscience. He cleanses us mentally, emotionally so we can move forward. Proverbs 28 tells us this. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. There's that promise. If we confess, we repent, we forsake it. We will have mercy. God will forgive us. And so we're told here, as I mentioned earlier, John the Baptist, as he was calling people to come and repent, to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Here in Matthew 3, 5 through 6, and of course, Mark 5 captures this as well. It says, then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, meaning John the Baptist, and they were baptized him for, and confessing their sins. Well, they do. They confessed their sins and they repented. And then they were baptized in the name of, you know, and, uh, for uh, remission of sins. They were confessing them. If we fast forward into the book of Acts, Jesus has ascended. He's gone to the be with the Lord. The apostles are, are spreading the gospel throughout the world. In Acts 19... 18, it says, and many who had believed came and confessing and telling their deeds. They, they came and they confessed. Again, they, they confessed their sin and they repented and they moved forward. And then James, James, one of this, James, which is Jesus' brother, who wrote the book of James. He begins to give us practical application of this. And he begins to say something here that this is what we fear. We don't fear confessing to God. We fear this piece right here. And mainly we fear this because we're afraid that people will look at us different. We will think they won't love us if they knew the truth. We think that they will dis, they will have a, you know, we'll lose respect if we tell them the truth. They, you know, we believe that people just, just can't accept us if they knew the truth. And look, we've all done things we're ashamed of. That's a fact. If you're a human being, you're a fallen creature, and you've done things you're ashamed of. But don't let that fear keep you. From doing this thing right here. And James says this. This is what we're more afraid of. More than confessing to God, we're afraid of this piece right here. James says this. 5.16. James 5.16. As a matter of fact, if you have your Bible, turn there. But he says this. He says, confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We don't fear confessing our trespasses to god we fear confessing our trespasses to one another but here's the deal we're all fallen creatures we've all sinned against god none of us none of us stand in a place of judgment 
And so if your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, whatever the situation may be, your children, they come and they confess a trespass to you. You have no place to stand in judgment. You have no place in your own life to stand there in judgment against them. And so if someone trusts you enough to come and confess something to you, as hurtful as it may be, as disappointing as it may be, I'm going to encourage you. Just as God is faithful and just to forgive, you also stand in that place of forgiveness, stand in that place of mercy and grace. And those of you who are here who need to confess, I'm going to encourage you, confess. Some of you have a separation in your family life because you've committed trespasses. You know you have, but you've, con you've refused to confess. And there is a wall between you and your spouse or a wall between you and your sibling or a wall between you and a parent because you've chosen to carry that trespass, to hide that trespass and not speak the truth. And you know there's something wrong there. You know something's broken. But if you would just confess, if you would come to that parent, if you would come to your spouse, if you would come to your sibling or your friend, maybe, maybe it's a friend, and you would come and you would just confess and allow God to heal you. See, because he says, look, we pray for one another that we may be healed. Confession brings healing. It brings restoration. So the psychological community has found that when people will write down or confess things that are going on inside, a lot of times addiction can be broken. Mental illness can be overcome. Depression can be moved away. Because those things a lot of times that are happening are because there's something inside that we failed to confess. And we haven't let it go. And it eats us up inside. And it keeps us prisoner. And so many people will turn to drugs to medicate the pain of the thing they're keeping inside. Many will turn to other things. Many won't be able to have intimacy with that partner. Many won't be able to come and look someone in the eye. And they avoid people they love because of the shame that they're carrying. But if you will confess one to another and pray for one another, you may be healed. You can be healed. Many of us are sick because of this right here. Because we failed to confess. We failed to speak the truth, own it, and allow God to free us and to come out of those things that we've struggled with for so long. And, of course, one of the most famous scriptures, it's what was in that song, that last song we saw. They put the scripture up. Go to 1 John 1, 9. Go ahead and turn there. 1 John 1, 9. And John tells us this. This is John who walked with Jesus. John who was there. He was the one who was there when Jesus was crucified on the cross. He was the one that was there who took Jesus' mother. He, he, he saw how Jesus conducted himself with those around him. And this is what he said. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He cleanses your conscience. He sets you free. If you want to be new, right? We're told that when we come to Christ, behold, all things have become new. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. The only way that happens is if we confess and release it. And Jesus is faithful. God is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is why I encourage you, if someone's confessing to you, to do the same. Because if you're going to be like your Father in heaven, if you're going to have the same character as our Father in heaven, if we're going to walk and be those who declare our Father in heaven, then we need to act as our Father would act. Sometimes someone's going to confess things to you. It's going to be painful. It's going to be hurtful. Matter of fact, it may absolutely terrify you in some areas. Could create insecurities. I got it. 
But if you want them to be able to confess, you need to create the environment where they can. Allow them to confess without judgment. Pray through that situation and allow your family, allow that relationship to be healed in Christ Jesus. And so we've talked about confession of personal sin. This is personal sin against God, personal sin against people. But there's another type of confession that's just as powerful. This is one that we in America need today. This is one that Israel needed before it went into captivity so desperately. And we're going to look at what happens here when, when we confess in this way. And so there's personal confession, but then there's a national confession. And so what we see here in 2 Chronicles 30, 22, Hezekiah, if you look at the kings, many of the kings, his father and other kings had been wicked in a lot of areas. And later on, his son will do even more wickedness. But what happens is the nation had been in rebellion against God. They'd gone into paganism. They were conducting uh, things like uh, sexual immoral acts as act of worship. They were burning their children in fire of Molech. They had done all of these things to really hurt the father in heaven and anger him because of their, their rebellion against him. And now a nation was coming against Judah. Hezekiah was the king of Judah, the southern king of Israel. But Hezekiah did something that the other kings didn't do. Hezekiah chose to humble himself. Instead of trying to hire Egypt to come fight for them or hire another kingdom to come fight with him and help him, he chose to repent and come before God. So he leads the nation as the leader. He would be like our president today. He was king of Judah. And so he came and he gave encouragement to all the Levites who taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they ate throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord of their fathers. They were confessing the sin of the nation and asking God to come intervene. And God did. He delivered them from their enemy because he chose as a leader to lead his people into confession. You might say, well, I'm not a, I'm not a president. I'm not king. No, but God's people can have such an influence. We're told that the the, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And like rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. And so you as God's people can repent for the nation, can declare the sin of the nation, and ask God to come and turn the heart of your leaders so God could turn them, that they may be able to repent and lead us back, back into the direction of serving God, seeking God, and submitting to God. Remember I told you Israel had been carried away. They didn't repent. After Hezekiah, a few kings later, their people were carried away to Babylon, and they were there for 70 years. Afterward, here we go, Ezra, that priest we told you about. Ezra was praying. Ezra was seeking God, going, Lord, what do we do now? And here's, here's what we see with him. He says, now, Ezra here in 10.1, he says, while Ezra was praying and while he was confessing and weeping and bowing before the house of God, a very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel. For the people wept bitterly. The people came. He led these people in a national confession, national repentance, to turn the nation back to the Lord. Because the nation had failed to do what they were supposed to do. Only 2% of the people who were captive in Babylon returned to Israel when God released them to come back. And that was by their own volition. That was by their own choice. The king would have released them, but they stayed. They got comfortable there. They got comfortable in the world, if you will, in a sense. Just like many of us today, we're comfortable in the world. But we're called to come back to God. Come out of the culture. Come back to him and live that life of righteousness and peace that's only in him. In the beginning of Israel's foundation, when God had brought them out of the wilderness, or had brought them out of Egypt, and they were in the wilderness, and God was building them as a nation. God told Aaron to present something uh, as the high priest of the nation. He was called to confess the sins of the nation over a goat. So if you will turn to Leviticus 16 for me, 
Leviticus 16.21, we're going to look at this. And it says, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat. Confess over the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by a hand of a suitable man. So even in the beginning, what we see is God has called us to confess our sin and he's called us to be the people who will even confess for our nation so our nation can turn. Fast forward later on, Leviticus 26, 40 through 42, God makes a promise to Israel because he knows they're going to be unfaithful. But he makes this promise. He says, but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me. And that they also have walked contrary to me and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If their, un, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, right? We humble ourselves to confess and they accept their guilt. In other words, we own our sin. Then I will remember the covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. And I will remember and I will remember the land. So he's making a promise. So when the people sin, when they do this, you know, I'm going to be contrary to them, right? I'm, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. He says, but when they humble themselves, when they confess their iniquity, they humble their hearts before me. I'll remember. And I'll remember the land. And, and, and then he brings them back. And so for us as God's people, we're called to be those that will allow God to do that in our land. Because let's face it, in our current culture, we couldn't get farther away from God if we tried. The things that we're putting in our legislation, the things that we're promoting on TV and, and in movies, things that were supposed to be for children, the things we're pushing in the educational system right now. It's ludicrous. And we need people. We need us as God's people to bind together, to come together and confess for our nation, repent for our nation and lift up our leaders and ask God to move on their hearts, to expose the lies, to reveal truth. And to allow us as a nation to repent before our God. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna take you to Daniel 9, 3 through 19. I want you to turn there with me. Because I want to I want you to see something. See, Daniel had been carried away captive during that 70 years that they were carried away captive in Babylon. And Daniel did something here. We see an example, a detailed example of what this confession for the nation and this repentance for the nation looks like so daniel turn with me to daniel 9 3 19 3 through 3 19 we're going to start in verse 3 and daniel begins to give his narrative and you get to see his posture and how he approached the lord it's not prideful he's not making excuses for himself but he says this he says then i set my face toward the lord god to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting sackcloth and ashes and i prayed to the lord my god and made confession and said O lord great and awesome god who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments we have sinned and committed iniquity we have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. We've done that today in America, haven't we? And we're seeing it worldwide because where America goes, the world goes. And so we see this happening. He goes on. He says, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to you, our kings and our princes and to our fathers and all the people of the land. In other words, we know God sent these people to us to warn us, and we didn't listen. He says, oh, Lord. He says, righteousness belongs to you. But shame of face. Right. As it is this day to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel to those near and those afar off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness that they have committed against you. Oh, Lord. To us belongs shame of face. To our king, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy, forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he has set before us by his servants, the prophets. Right? And we failed to obey the word of God, haven't we? We have failed to obey the words of Jesus. 
says, yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse of the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, right? God always confirms his word. Which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. So God didn't allow that disaster to come upon them without telling them about it. Not only did he declare it to them, he made them write it down. That if they turned from him, if they committed the sin that they committed, these things would happen. So God warned them, and then he went ahead like a good parent. And he confirmed his word by doing what he said he would do because because God cannot lie. It's impossible for him to lie. So he had to fulfill his word as much as he wanted to hold it back. He had to confirm his word. He had to bring judgment or punishment or correction upon Israel. Right. To bring them back as he said he would because he wrote it in his law. Right. He says, therefore, the Lord has kept this disaster, kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us for the Lord. Our God is righteous in all his works, which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because our sins and our iniquities of our fathers. You notice how he's owning it. He's saying, Lord, you did this because of what we did. You did this because we rejected you. You did this. You're righteous in what you did because we, we chose to disobey. He's owning that. Now, he may not be the only one, right? He's probably not the only one that sinned. As a matter of fact, he may have not have said, oh, we, we saw how Daniel conducted himself. If you read the book of Daniel, he kept, he kept himself to the law of God in Babylon. But he's owning it for his people, right? And so he goes on. He says, now, therefore, God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications for the Lord's sake. Cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. He's talking about the broken down temple. And oh, my God, incline your ear and hear and open your, your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Like, he's like, I'm not asking you to, to, to help me because we're righteous. As a matter of fact, I'm confessing my guilt before you. But I'm asking you to do this for your, because of your own name, because of your great mercies. And we know you're a merciful God. Hear Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act and do not delay for your for your own sake. My God, for your city and your people are called by your name. So he appeals to God in his name. He doesn't even appeal because they're not righteous. They've rejected God. They have done abominations and wickedness, which God warned them not to do and even told them what would happen when they did. And so he's telling God, you were righteous for judging. You were righteous for what happened. You were righteous for what you did. However, because of your mercy and because of your name, please forgive. And guess what? We have a right to do that for America today. Nehemiah 9.1. Nehemiah, again, another man of God who helped the people return, the first wave, if you will, return back to Israel from Babylon when they were released. It says, now on the 24th day of the month, the children of Israel were assembled with fastings and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. The nose of Israel of the Israelite lineage separated themselves from all the foreigners and they stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law, the Lord, the Lord their God, for one fourth of the day and for another fourth, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. So you see how powerful this confession for your nation can be. We in Christ Jesus, by the spirit of God, have the power to move our nation in a different direction. And we're going to have a day here with WOTC where we're going to pray. I'm going to reach out to some other churches and ask if they will come with us. Have a day of repentance for America. Have a day of confession for America. 
is I believe our God can turn our nation. I believe he can change the hearts and minds of the legislature. As a matter of fact, uh, on Thursday, myself and Ted and many others, there was 400 people that went down to the legislature in Delaware, down in, in, in Legislative Hall down in Dover, Delaware. And we stood and we prayed for the leaders and we prayed for our nation and, and for our state to turn and declared the truth. And so we have the power. We have the authority in Christ Jesus by the spirit to do this for our nation. And I'm asking you even before we gather together that on a daily basis and when you're in time of prayer, that you confess the sin of our nation, that you confess and ask God for forgiveness and ask God to turn our nation because we need it. If we don't turn, we will experience judgments just like Israel experienced. And as a matter of fact, many believe, and they're probably right, that 9-11 and this virus are what we call shakings or warnings or harbingers to get America to wake up and turn. We don't want to see something worse than the virus hit us. That shut down the whole nation for almost two years. So this is a very powerful thing. Now we're going to switch. We're going to look at a different type of confession. We're going to look at a confession of God, confession for the name of God, confession that leads us to declaring who he is, who he is in us. And so we're going to move to confession of God's name. Now, a lot of the confession that we're going to talk about in the next few slides are confessions that they lead. They all come back to God, right? They're all confessing God, but it's in a different way. So in 1 Kings 8.33, it says, when your people are defeated before you, and this is what this is, so you know, this is Solomon praying. So they built the temple of God. They dedicated the people, uh, dedicated the temple before God, right? Solomon, he's the third king of Israel. He's David's son. And he's built the temple for God's name. It's the first time they've actually had a temple that was immovable. Before they had the tabernacle and it was carried by the priest and it was moved around. But now in Jerusalem, they've built this temple, this magnificent temple. And so he's dedicating the temple. But, but Solomon realizes that the people are prone to sin. And so he makes a request of God. And so he says this. He says here in 1 Kings 8, 33, when your people, not if, when they are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you. And when they turn back to you and confess your name and pray. And makes supplication to you in this temple, right? He goes on. He says here in 1 Kings 8, uh, 35, he says, And when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you. And when they pray, excuse me, toward this place and confess your name. There it is again. To turn from their sin because you afflict them. That's exactly what happened. That's what we just discussed with Nehemiah and all those folks returning. And Daniel while he's in Babylon in captivity. They've done. They, they turned and they... They prayed toward the temple, and they lifted up the name of God. What happened? He brought them back. He released them. He put it upon the heart of King Cyrus to start to release the people. And Silas started releasing them back to Israel. And so God answered the prayer that Solomon prayed, of course, several hundred years later. But he answered the prayer. And kept his word because they chose to humble themselves and pray. But the confession was in God's name. You notice that Daniel prayed. He says, look, I pray not because we're righteous, but because of your name. And when we confess his name, what we see is God move in ways that we thought maybe in some cases were absolutely impossible to happen. Well, along this lines of confessing God's name, there's the confession of Christ. And that's what we've done as we've entered into salvation. We've confessed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, haven't we? We've confessed him as Lord. We confess our sin. We confess that he's Lord. We confess that he came in the flesh, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life. We confess that he suffered and died on the cross, right? And three days later, he rose again, defeating death, hell, and the grave. And that he ascended to the Father, and he's making intercession for us today. We, we confess that his spirit has been released into us, and by his spirit, we can know him. We can walk in him. He says, Jesus made this statement 
to the to the apostles. He told them, he says, look, in, in Matthew 10, 32. He also mentioned this, of course, in Luke 12, 8. But he says, therefore, whoever confesses me, this is Jesus speaking before men. I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. You notice that's an if then statement. Therefore, whoever confesses me before him, before men, I'll confess before my father in heaven. We are called to confess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We're not, we don't confess the name of Buddha or Allah or any other thing. We confess the name of Jesus Christ because it's faith in his name that leads to salvation. There's no faith. There's no salvation in any other name. And so here in Philippians 2, 9, 11, it says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth. And those under the earth. And I want you to pause a minute because it says of those in heaven. Think about who's in heaven right now. Think about who's in heaven. Who else is bowing at the name of Jesus? Just ponder that for a minute. I'm not even going to say anything. So of those on earth and those under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The Father receives glory when we confess Jesus Christ is Lord. The Father doesn't compete with Jesus. He receives glory because Jesus says, well, when we've seen him, we've seen the father. Go to Romans 15, eight and nine. Paul writing to the church, the Roman church, he begins to say, he says, now I say that Jesus Christ has become the servant to the circumcision. In other words, the servant for those who were the children of Israel who were circumcised for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. And he goes on, he says, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as is written. For this reason, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And so, of course, he saved those of the circumcision who call upon his name. But he's also those who the Gentiles can cry out. You and me can cry out to him. by confessing his name. Hebrews 3 1 tells us, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. He is the high priest of our confession. He is the one we confess above all, above all others. The writer of Hebrews goes on to tell us here in Hebrews 10 19 through 23, he says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, his death and burial on the cross, right? Having a high priest over the house of God. You didn't think we had a high priest, did you? You thought that was the Old Testament. No, we have a high priest. His name is Jesus, right? A high priest over the house of God. That is the church today. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an Evil conscience. Remember, I told you if you're faithful to, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse, cleanse you. He's he's sprinkling or cleansing you from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Right. And of course, John, the same one who wrote that if we confess our sin, he's faithful to forgive. John writes. Someone's got a hot mic. <laughs> he says by this, he says, by this, you know, here in John 1, 4, 2, that the spirit of God, right? The spirit of God, the spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh, right, is, a, is of God. So we know that Jesus came through the virgin birth. And then he is God in the flesh. He says, every spirit that confesses that is of God. And then John 4.15, he says, 1 John 4.15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And so we have this confession again that leads us in and solidifies our walk in and through Christ. We go on. Now we have a confession of faith. It, it is the same because it's the faith in Jesus Christ, but it's a confession of that faith 
and we're going to look at some things after here because the church, the 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 the, the historic church, began to develop these creeds, if you will, that we're going to look at about the confession of faith. But we, I want to look specifically at the confession of faith, and I want you all to turn with me to Romans ten nine and ten. This is extremely extremely important. Because people will tell you, you have to do this thing to get saved. You have to do that thing to get saved. You know, you have to perform this act to be saved. You have to, to do whatever. But if you want to know what salvation looks like, if you want to know how to enter this relationship with Jesus Christ, you notice I said enter. It's the beginning. It's not the end all to be all. It's the beginning. It's how you enter this relationship. This is where we get it. This is what we call the confession of faith. This is this is what we do to enter into this relationship. What those creeds do is they solidify what we're saying we believe in in this confession of faith. And so if you turn to Romans 10, 9, and 10, you need to see this. You need to understand this. So Romans 10, 9, and 10, he says, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. By the way, not faith just to have faith. Faith in Jesus Christ speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. No one's good enough to go to heaven. No one, no one has, other than Jesus Christ, no one has lived a sinless life. Who will descend into the abyss? No one can suffer enough to make God feel sorry for them. It doesn't work that way. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. So there's two places it happens. You're speaking something out of your mouth, and you're truly believing something in your heart. Of what I tell you about faith, faith makes you take action. Real faith has action. That's why James says faith without works is dead. Why? Because real faith has action behind it. And so we got two things going on here. We're believing in our heart, and we're taking some action with the words that we speak. So he says the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. What's that, what's that word of faith to which you preach? That Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He rose again. He goes on. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. You notice they're taking an action. They're saying it out loud. They're confessing Christ. They're confessing that God raised him from the dead. They're confessing that Christ paid for their sin. They're confessing. Okay, that's what we do. That's our confession of faith. That it only happens in Jesus Christ. It doesn't happen by a religious system. It doesn't happen by obeying a bunch of rules. It doesn't happen because of anything else, but because we've chosen to believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin, that God raised him from the dead. That is what allows us to enter, if you will, the doorway of this relationship with Jesus Christ. And then we take action and we confess it out loud. You know, the Lord said, we looked at that, that verse in Matthew, that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. And so you make confession. And so there, there's action behind it. You've made the confession. It's not enough to just believe. We're told that, in the book of James, he says, look, even the demons, demons believe and tremble. He says, you believe, you've done well, but even demons believe and tremble. But for Christians, we take action. And so we've confessed with our mouth. We declare it. And of course, then we live it. We live out what we say we believe. And our life changes. And we repent of sin because we believe what Jesus did on the cross. If we believe what he did, then our life has to change. If we believe what he did, we have to do something different than what we were doing before. If we believe what he did, our day-to-day -day choices, our day-to-day -day thought patterns, our day-to-day -day desires begin to change if that's true. A person who has no change but says they believe is someone who hasn't repented and truly hasn't come into the relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know that's a tough saying. Many hear that and go, oh, so you're judging who's saved. No, the scripture does. But as James said, right? Faith without works is dead. Faith without a change. Faith without fruit. Jesus says you'll know them by the fruit. I didn't say it. The word said it. 
I don't get my opinion. I get to teach what the word already says. God didn't ask me for my opinion. He didn't ask you. He told us what it looks like. So if we, first Timothy, Paul is instructing this, this young pastor, Timothy, this guy that he discipled, had traveled with him across his missionary journeys. And now he set him in the church of, of Ephesus. He says, just before he leaves, this will be the last time Paul uh, communicates with Timothy. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and confess the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He confessed Christ before people. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. He declared that he was king. He declared that he was Lord before Pontius Pilate. And so, so us, we declare it and we live it. And the writer of Hebrews has one more thing. He says, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, just Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Why would he say that? Well, I'm going to tell you why he says that. Because the church at this time was still free at that time to preach the gospel. But they had some persecution from the Jews, some persecution from the Rome. But eventually, fast forward a few hundred years or into 303 AD, and the church, after several emperors, is suffering persecution like they'd never seen before. And under the hand of Diocletian, many, many Christians were just absolutely tortured and slaughtered, and he tried to get them to recant their faith in Jesus Christ. And he just murdered thousands and thousands of Christians, and many other emperors would do the same. Paul knew this writer of Hebrews knew that we needed to hold fast. Face it today. Look at the culture right now. The things that are being put forward. If you speak against things that are culturally acceptable right now, you will be persecuted. If you don't believe me, go on Facebook and put a post and write some scripture about certain things that are, that are what the scripture says about certain culture accepted practices right now. And see what type of backlash you get. There are people who have lost their jobs for speaking the truth. Matter of fact, there was just a school teacher. She, they just went to court. They're going to let her return to school, but she lost her job for speaking the truth. She wasn't willing to give in to the cultural push that was happening in the educational system, and they fired her. And so in that, we need to be able to hold fast our confession. And so, as a matter of fact, one of those confessors survived Diocletian. He had been tortured for several years in prison for three years was St. Nicholas. And we've talked about St. Nicholas before. This is the figure who would eventually be the model, the personage of Santa Claus. But he was a real bishop out of Turkey. And he suffered terribly at the hands of Diocletian. Question is, is will you confess? We're going to, in BTA, we're going to look at a video of several popular pastors who've been put on the spot and they're being pushed by media to speak on some cultural things. And what you're going to see is out of, I think there's like six of them, only one keeps his confession of faith. Only one stands up for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unashamedly, unapologetically, not out of a heart of meanness, not out of anger, not out of, you know, uh, a spirit of judgment toward anyone else. But he makes the statement, and this is true, it's scripture actually. If you stand before someone and you lie, you don't love them. To tell someone that a lie is the truth and the truth is a lie, that's not loving them. The scripture says faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And the church has been doing a lot of kissing to ensure that it stays relevant instead of speaking the truth and standing on the faith of Jesus Christ. And so I want to show you what the early church did, second century on, um, and, and really in some a little later, you're going to see that they developed these what we call creeds. But what they are is confessions of faith. And there are 
essentially uh, four of them that have pretty much shaped what most of the modern church believes today. And we're going to look at those just real shortly. So one of those confessions is the Apostles' Creed, and you guys might have heard this. And it's set up in these, these quick statements. It's not very long. But what they did is they wanted the church to understand what they believe and how to walk it out. And so they've set this confession of faith. And so this creed says, I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth. If you remember back to the worship songs, two of them had these statements in this, right? It said, in Jesus Christ, the only begotten son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, buried, and he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God, uh, the uh, Father Almighty. From thence, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. In other words, the ones who are alive and the ones who are dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Now, this Catholic Church they're talking about is not the Roman Catholic Church. This is the Catholic Church prior to the Roman Church. This is before you had the, what we, we see today as the Roman Catholic Church. The word Catholic means universal. And so early on, the church fathers believed in a universal church. And so this is, means the universal church and communion of the saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Not long after this, this time frame, they believe uh, this was written in around 390 A.D. So somewhere in the neighborhood of about. 200 years after Christ. So they begin to um, write these creeds as, as this confession. Later on, 325 AD, when the emperor Constantine begins to accept Christianity as his belief system and then wants to make it a state religion, he brings all of the bishops. There's over 500 come together, including that St. Nicholas we talked about. He was there. And he says, look, you need to come together and put something together so everybody knows what we believe, what we are to follow. And so they took that Apostles' Creed and then added and, and added some clarification. And you're not seeing all of the creed here, but I want to show you what they put in there. It says, we believe in one God, the Father, Almighty, maker of all things, visible and invisible. And this is an example. This is an answer to. Um, a heretic called Arius. Arius believed that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament were different gods. He believed that Jesus, he is actually also the father of Gnosticism that believed that all matter is evil. So Jesus couldn't have come in the flesh because all matter is evil. And so they put this together to answer that heresy. It says, we believe in one God, the Father, Almighty, maker of all things, visible and invisible. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, of you know, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made in heaven and on earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was incarnate and was made man. He suffered, and the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven, and thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And so they attempted here to clarify some things to ensure that there was no misconception of who Jesus was, of one essence. Begotten of the Father, not made, right? They, they have not made, being of one substance with God. They were very clear. They were trying to clarify who Jesus was. Fast forward to the symbol or the creed of Chalcedon. This one here was one of the most clear because it, it took all of those and then put it in a consolidated form whereby the church understood what we believe. And, of course, there's some things that are not changing. We believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things, visible and invisible. So you see a lot of the stuff that was in the old one, right? 
and in one Lord Jesus, only begotten, Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of gods, light of light, right? Very similar to the other, right? Very God, right? Very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, was made man, was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. And now, so this one here is not just a declaration, but according to the scriptures. So they go back to what was written in the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the father. He shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And so they add that it goes on. It says, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord God and giver of life who proceeds from the father and the son who with the father and the son together is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets. And I believe the Holy Catholic, again, an apostolic church. So you get both of those in there. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so that's the, the confession or the what they call the symbol or the creed uh, of Chalcedon or, or of, of Constantinople. So then you go to the creed of Chalcedon and they, again, they can kind of confirm this a little better. And so we following the Holy Fathers with all one consent, teach men to confess one and the same son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God, truly man, of reasonable or rational soul of the body, co-substantial, right, or consubstantial or co-substantial with us according to the manhood and all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead and in these latter days for us, for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood, one in the same Christ, Son, Lord, and only begotten to be acknowledged in two natures. See, they're very specific, right? And confusedly and unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away, because this is where they're trying to say it's fully God, fully man, by the union, but rather the property of each nature is being preserved and concurring in one person and one substance, not parted or divided into two persons. Remember that what Arius was saying was two different gods. He said, no, they're the same. But one and the same, son and only begotten God of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. And so this, again, this clarification, this came about, they believe at about 451. And then the Athanasian Creed. And I'm not going to read too much of this. Um, you guys can follow up. You can see this on, on our uh, website later on. Athanasius was one who fought Arius. As a matter of fact, who declared Arius a heretic. And this was done somewhere in the neighborhood. They believe... Those that believe he wrote it believe it was done about 373 AD. However, many believe it's in none of his writings. And so it was done later for about 450 to 600 AD. But he says, whosoever will be saved. You hear the language that Jesus used, whosoever. Right. Before all things is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Well, again, this is the universal faith. Which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled without doubt. And I'm not going to read all this. So he starts to kind of declare who the son is and what we believe and how we believe it. It's extremely important that you guys know about these things because a lot of what you believe today is because of these creeds. These particular confessions have shaped what modern Christianity believes. But we don't live by creeds. We live by the word of God. So that being said, there's a second one because this one's pretty long. That being said, I want you to understand that everything we do, we do by scripture, not because of a creed, not because of a tradition. We do by the word of God. 
And so as I teach you, I'm going to always lead you back. I'm always going to give you history and content. I'm always going to give you the background of what I'm sharing with you because it's important that you guys get this. And so today, as I've taught you about confession, there's confession of sin. There's personal confession. There's confession for your nation and taking ownership of the sin of that nation. Then there's your confession of God, confession of Christ, confession of faith. There's confession of what you believe and then walking that out. Because even though you confess, right, and you've entered this relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to walk it out. We need to be those that don't just confess, but those that live it. Faith without works is dead. And so if we say we believe in Jesus, we do what Jesus called us to do. And so I encourage you, if you are someone carrying personal sin, things you haven't repented of, things that, that you haven't confessed to anyone, I encourage you to find someone you trust. Find someone you trust and confess it. Because that will set you free. You will be delivered. You always hear me talk about being transparent before God. Anything that you try to hide, which you can't, by the way, you may hide it from man, but you'll never hide it from God. You imprison yourself. And it's a prison that only you can set you free from. So if you've got that, I encourage you, confess and be free. Confess and restore your family. Confess and be healed. We know what our the condition our nation's been in. So I encourage you to join me and others in confessing the sin of our nation and asking God to heal us, asking God to turn our nation back to him. And on a day-to-day basis, confessing Christ even when it costs us because it will eventually cost you. Eventually, you're going to find yourself at odds against culture or odds against someone who may be who you value in your life because they don't confess Christ. And it, and it can strain relationships. And you need to be one who is willing to confess Christ even when it's costly. This isn't popular today. We, we want a nice message that tell us how to, how to uh, you know, overcome and how to make fewer mistakes. But we need to be Christians who can walk this Christian life out. We need to be Christians who are mature. We can, we, we can walk out this faith in a way that when it gets hard, remember those confessors we told you about. They were being tortured for the faith. They were being tortured, and, 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 and they wanted them to recant their faith. And those like Nicholas that survived, they called them confessors because they refused. They refuse to recant. They refuse to backtrack. They refuse to water down the truth. My friends, today, in our current culture, you have to decide, am I going to water down the gospel? Am I going to refuse to stand if it's going to get someone calling me bad names, if, I'm, if someone's going to attack me verbally, if I'm going to be bullied? Or when the legislature, and eventually they will, they'll pass laws where they try to keep us from preaching and teaching the gospel, you have to decide, will I be one who will do what God has called me to do, even if it costs me? Because we are called to be those who will be those modern day confessors. We will be those who will stand when others won't stand. When we're put on the spot, what are we going to say? What are we going to do? And so we need to be those who confess Christ in those times when it's not popular. You've heard me say this before. To many, and Paul talked about this, the, cro the cross is offensive. Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no one comes to the Father except by me. That's offensive to many. But to those of us who are born again, those of us who are being saved, it's truth. Question is, will we stand on it? Will we stand for it? Will we declare it when it's not popular? And so that's something each and every one of us has to decide. So with that, I want to encourage you. You're not alone. As God told uh, Elijah, I've reserved 7,000 men who haven't bowed their knee to Baal. There's literally thousands and millions of Christians standing with you. And so when you feel burden, when you feel afraid, when you feel the pressure, 
reach out to us. We're here for you. We're here to lift you up. We're here to pray with you and pray for you and stand with you. That you can stand when it's hard to stand. That you can resist the enemy when he's trying to push cultural norms that we know that violate God's word. We're here with you. And so we stand as a unified church. That's why they talked about the Catholic church. A unified church. A universal church. We stand together with believers all over the world to stand for Christ Jesus. And so we're here with you. So I'm going to stop recording right now.